Croeso Canersi Balb, a brief Llyfrigaeth, Dalenba Shanklin. A warm welcome to everybody to the main library in the Shanklin Reading Room. Cyfarth with the Llyfrigaeth Lawr at Achlibai Bwy. My name is Sue Hodges and I'm the Director of Libraries and Archives. I have great pleasure in presenting um, uh, Professor Jason Walter Davis and Professor Tim Brown this evening, who are going to talk about the art storehouse, the creative world of R.S. Thomas and Elsie Eldridge. Um, and I think Jason will tell you all about the history, a little bit of the R.S. Thomas Centre and the work that's been doing here, that's been done here around research and so on. So a great pleasure to welcome them, and thank you. Pass over to Professor Jason Walter Davis. Um, it's great to be here uh, as part of these seminars. Um, I'd like to kick off, to begin at the beginning, as another Thomas said, um, with that photograph. Uh, both of us look very much younger in that photograph. <laughs> uh, the RS Thomas uh, Research Centre was opened in April, 7th of April uh, 2000, following the appointment of RS. Uh, to an honorary professorship in the Department of Welsh at the time. Uh, we remember vividly, don't we, totally packed lecture room one where Thomas uh, delivered what turned out to be, unfortunately, uh, his final public reading. And it was a, it was a great, a striking, memorable reading as well. Um, he was very pleased at the establishment of a research centre in his name at his old university. And he was also very pleased that it was just that, uh, a joint venture between the Welsh Department and the English Department, and that was a source of great pride to RS. The centre uh, currently is recognised as one as only a, of only a handful of uh, official research centres at Bangor, and we've developed it, Tony and I, over the last 15 years into what is now what constitutes a major British poetry uh, archive, and it has established itself as the number one location for the study of the work of this major 20th century poet. Um, we welcome on a regular basis uh, visitors, uh, visiting scholars and so on from all over the world. Uh, to give you some idea, recent visits and inquiries have been uh, coming from uh, Australia, Poland, Norway, Germany, France, United States and so on. And both of us field inquiries uh, weekly, if not daily, uh, regarding aspects of Thomas's work. What do we have then? Well, you'll see uh, various uh, striking examples of these in a minute, but the archive is the definitive repository for Thomas's published work. Of all the critical work uh, on him, uh, we al also have the most comprehensive uh, manuscript uh, collection of, of his work in existence, uh, which now runs to several thousand individual items. And we also have uh, a substantial collection of hitherto unpublished Thomas work, with also important holdings of things like audiovisual work and that, uh, and that type of thing. More of this later from Tony, but we've also been building up in the past five, six, seven years a major collection of work by R.S. Thomas's first wife, uh, the artist M. E. Eldridge, more on which later. So. And the opening, what, what have we got? Well, how do we choose these slides? How do you choose the individual items? Well, I'm going to start with that. Now, um, those of you perhaps in the front can see uh, uh, who's who there. R.S. Thomas is this guy here, out of the limb on the left, as it were. This photograph is from a Chirk newspaper and is captioned, I love this caption, clergyman footballers. The rugby team composed of clergymen from Wrexham and District who played against the Nutsford Test School, Harton, yesterday. Ah, those European glamour ties. <laughs> clergyman footballers. Another caption I always uh, think of when I'm uh, looking at this um, particular photograph is God's First Fifteen. <laughs> uh, the, the photo dates from the late 1930s during Thomas's period as a curate in Chirk. And as I said, Thomas is the winger here. He played on the wing on the left. And his interest, indeed, his active participation in rugby football uh, might come as a surprise to many, but uh, his love of the game was very, very evident to those who uh, knew him. In his volume, Abiek Neb, uh, ABC Neb, 1995, he discusses playing for two teams. One of them is a Hollyhead team when he was a schoolboy, and also for Bangor's third <laughs> rugby team, playing on the wing and experiencing cold feet, literally, from having to kick his heels, literally, and hang out on the wind. Now, many would be tempted to see this photograph as a sim symbol of what R.S. himself, though, of course, never the recluse 
that the English newspapers and some people in Wales were trying to make him, uh, him into. But R.S. did describe himself as one who sang, and I quote, a little aside from the main road. So there you have him as part of the 15. He's, he's always slightly on the left, on the wing, uh, uh, or a little aside from the main scrum in this case, I, I, I think. I'll move on to uh, that and uh, welcome Tony. <laughs> yes, when we, we uh, after he opened the, uh, uh, the centre that night, uh, we had uh, dinner up at Oswald's, uh, as it was then, uh, around Victoria Drive, and he reminisced about playing rugby on where the, where the rugby fields evidently used to be where the halls of residence now are. And again, yes, you remembered the cold hands. Those of us who played on the wing remember the cold hands. R.S. in fact began to write poetry while he was a student here at Bangor and he had several poems published in uh, the student magazine under the resonant name of Curtis Langdon. He said, I have no idea where I got the name from. I think it was one of those Edwardian novelists that my mother used to, to read. Uh, he heard somebody in the uh, common room on one occasion uh, sounding off about that wretched, I think that was the word, <laughs> that wretched Curtis Langdon. Uh, and he's not going to publish any more of his poems. So uh, he submitted uh, another poem under the name of Figaro, and they got that published as well. Um, anyway, I, after he graduated, goes down to Cardiff to do his uh, theological uh, training. He becomes curator at Chirk. This by now is in the second half of the 30s. And walking, uh, he writes about walking in the uh, Dufferin Cairiog. And he continued to write poetry. And eventually, uh, he put the poems he was writing together in a collection called Spindrift. And we don't know if he ever sent it to a publisher, but it remained unpublished. Uh, it's only recently resurfaced, but we did have already uh, a Xerox of the whole thing, and it's in the next room, and I, when we finished, I'll open the door. The, the published material of RS is in the room here. The manuscripts and stuff are all done in the archives. Uh, as I say, we don't know if he ever sent this typescript to a publisher, all the poetry he'd written in the late 30s. Uh, it's pretty awful stuff. Uh, it really is. The poems are suffused with the unfocused, dramatic longings of that young man who wandered through Cairiog. Uh, the rural scenery is everywhere in these poems. Uh, it's usually dusk. Uh, here's a few lines. The mystic hour when whitely shone the unknown flower and darkling wings had swept away the last pale streamings of the day. You can see what I mean. Uh, the language is derivative and dated. Behold, o'er, thou art, cometh, maids are everywhere. This is in the late 1930s. Think of what was going on in English poetry. This is a decade and a half and more after The Waste Land, which he clearly hadn't read. But one poem in Spindrift does seem to be rather more focused. It's called simply Sonnet. And I'll read it. I never thought in this poor world to find another who would love the things I love, the rain, the silent hills, the sky above. One who was beautiful and grave and kind, who struck no discord in my dreaming mind, content to live with silence like a cloak about her tender thoughts. Or if she spoke, her gentle voice was music on the wind. And then about the ending of the day, always, in early spring, when the soft western breeze had chased the melancholy clouds afar, as up a little hill I took my way, I found you all alone upon your knees, your face uplifted to the evening star. Well, it's, it's still not exactly modernist, um, but it's in Spindrift, and here it is in another scrap of paper. It's torn top and bottom. But it's evidently from a letter, and almost certainly it must be a letter to Elsie. I have been reading over my poems. Do you remember this? Not good, perhaps, but true. And then the poem. 
do you remember? Uh, because this, we think, is the young poet's first poem to the woman who in 1940 uh, was to become uh, his wife. The reference to the cloak is interesting. We'll say a little bit more about Elsie's background in a moment. But, you know, one of the things that a number of people mention is the, the cloak that she wore rather dramatically uh, wrapped around her in, in Chirk. Okay, then, who was that woman? Well, there she is. Very glamorous, very glamorous. Tony will talk more about Elsie's work in a minute. This um, is, uh, well, these are studio portraits, aren't they, of Elsie, dated 1934 dated 1934. So the question is, what can we read into or indeed out of a photograph? Well, I think it's safe to say here that uh, these studio images bespeak a woman who was already at this time, the 1930s, way, way before her husband, and that's a point to make, I think, a hugely successful artist, um, someone who was establishing quite a name for herself on the art scene in London, who wore that cloak with a flourish, as Tony's mentioned, who drove an open-topped Bentley. That's what we're dealing with here, that kind of class. And who was to have in, in this period, in this very period, um, uh, a sell-out one-woman uh, exhibition of her work at the Beaux-Arts ga Gallery in London. And so it must be emphasised that she was the experienced artist, she was the worldly wise one here, and as Tony will mention in a minute, she was uh, we think uh, the major influence or one of the major influences uh, as far as RS's poetry is concerned right at the, at the beginning from 1940 onwards uh, or a bit earlier obviously they married in 1940. Um, who, who, who does that remind you of? What kind of who, which film star? That's pure Get Greta Garbo isn't it? Greta Garbo. Um, and so Tony do you want to talk a bit more about Elsie herself? They met in Turk. Uh, she, for reasons which are not entirely clear, uh, gave up the artistic exhibitioning uh, life of uh, London. I, I think part of it was, frankly, she just needed to get a job. Uh, she'd come back from a, uh, some months in Italy, which she'd won on a scholarship. So she'd spent months in Italy, met Bernard Berenson. She toured um, in Italy and painted, obviously, from... Uh, her scholarship from the Royal College of Art. Um, she writes somewhere in a journal that she thought about going to India at that point. Uh, this is about 34, 35. Um, Travelling as a single woman in India would have been perhaps a problem. Anyway, she fetches up in Oswestry. Uh, 1935, we know she's in Oswestry. Uh, we just have an empty envelope readdressed to her, but it's got a postmark. You know, so we know she's an artist. Anyway, she meets R.S. Uh, he says in his autobiography she lived nearby. In fact, she lived in the same house. It was a boarding house in uh, in Cherks. But I mean, obviously, you know, uh, you have to uh, not be too overt about the same address. She said we got a different address on the wedding certificate. Uh, but here they are. Uh, they get married in Bala. Um, as somebody said, he doesn't exactly look overjoyed. He's standing again, a little apart. Uh, the bag lady at the back, and I don't know why the photographer just didn't have to get out of the way, is almost certainly um, Elsie's mother. This, this we only got uh, some years after the centre was opened. A, a cousin sent it to me uh, from Port Albert, and it's been published since. But this is what happens. People, stuff comes out of, the, out of the woodwork, as it were, or, or, or through, through the mail. Uh, Gwydion, the son, had never seen this, this photograph. Uh, it, was, it was not around. Um, this, again, is in one of her sketchbooks. We have a number of her early sketchbooks from about this period, 1940. Uh, this is a drawing, obviously, of her, her young husband um, at this point. The portrait, uh, as I said, is in the sketchbook, alongside many of the wonderful watercolour drawings of uh, the natural world landscapes from Italy and from the area around Chur, but also, and there's one in the, the case along the, the way here, minutely detailed drawings of, of flowers, uh, various plants, 
and a couple of sheets of these. The mice have been at one corner of that, um, but these are watercolour. And when you open, you look at these sheets, you think you can always pick them up. They're, they're so detailed, they're, they're so remarkably vivid. I make this point because I think, again, uh, it's interesting in relation to R.S. I said that R.S.'s early poetry was old-fashioned. It was well out of, it was pretty war Georgianism. There's no sign he's read Hopkins, let alone Eliot or Yeats. He'd, after all, if you think about it for a moment, he'd been here as a, stud, uh, a student of classics, not of English. Uh, he'd spent his whole upbringing far from the cultural centres. Elsie, however, as we've suggested, her background was very different. She'd been in France um, uh, when she was a schoolgirl. Uh, she'd travelled in Italy. She'd been in artistic London. She'd read her modernist poetry. She'd certainly read her Yeats. She talks about Yeats in a letter. Again, somebody sent her some letters from uh, uh, the mother of this person who sent the letters had been a student of Elsie's in Oswestry. And there's a wonderful clutch of letters from 1940. She's just got married. And she, she's telling this. She, she's a little bit like Miss Brodie in these letters, you know, from Miss Jean Brodie. You know, we Yates, she's saying. And clearly she was saying the same to R.S. She gives him a copy of Yates. We know because we've got it in the room next door. Her impact on him, as, as uh, Jason already suggested, was very considerable. Just imagine her impact on him. He's been brought up in Hollyhead. He's been as far as Bangor. Uh, he spends a year in theological college in Lambeth, back to Chirk. And into his life comes this Greta Garpo, the cloak, the Bentley, the background. I mean, he must have, she must have knocked his socks off. Um, her impact on him is considerable in terms of reading. She encourages him to, to read Yeats and I'm sure other uh, modernist writers. And she teaches him how to look, to look at the natural world. Again, in one of these letters to this former student, she says, people don't look enough. You know, and as an artist, she looks very intently. Now, by the time of R.S. Thomas's first published volumes, uh, uh, of the uh, 1940s. Uh, the emotion-washed, literary-derived natural scenes of Spindrift are replaced by an altogether more precise looking at the world itself. Here is uh, uh, some lines from The Stones of the Field, this first book. And bare as a sky, the wind-sucked bone shows blue the buried blood swells in the frosted vein. I mean, there's a precision there which is entirely lacking in those early ones. And perhaps even more striking, it may be a coincidence, but uh, a poem called Farm Boy, we get this. Mark how the sun has freckled his smooth face like a finch's egg under that bush of hair. By this point, He's learned to look. Oh, I'll move on just to one. Sorry, I knew that was going to happen. This again, this is her looking. This is in one of the uh, sketchbooks. Um, you can perhaps come and have a look at it closely. But the, I mean, just look at the veining here. This is watercolour. Um, again, early, uh, about the same period in Chirk. Uh, and it's, it's wholly typical of... Um, how she developed uh, uh, later. Landscapes continue, but this precise drawing of the natural world. Okay. Thanks. I'll just go back to that for a minute. Tony just quoted that line, didn't he? That brilliant image, the buried blood, mm. the veining. Mm. I mean, who knows how these connections come about, but um, certainly they're in the background. Um, I'd like to draw to your attention, to, uh, this to your attention. Now, this is um, a fascinating uh, entry from R.S. Thomas's journal as a student in St. Michael's Theological 
College in Llandaf, where he was training for the priesthood in the 1930s. This is dated, as you can see, March the 3rd, 1936. Um, and I'll, I'll read it to you. We had a dinner here tonight in keeping with St. David's Day, which we kept tonight. After dinner, the dean made a speech and some pinillion was sung. And I thought of the old Welsh, driven from the south and east shores of Albion into the vastness of the west, where they cling, thank you, where they cling fiercely to their traditions and their language, and how this is almost the same now as then. A haunting sadness in their voices, a dreamy sound of streams ever in their ears, and the sad colours of the hills ever before their eyes, and the occasional echo of a call to arms that brings to the light of fanaticism back to their eyes. For England has long forgotten that she conquered Wales, but Wales will never forget. Now, that's fascinating because what, what it is, of course, is an early and romantic and romanticised view of Wales. It's interesting uh, in two respects, in many respects, but two in particular. This entry uh, predates the famous cultural epiphany that RS experienced later that decade as a curate uh, in Chirk, which he describes thus in his autobiography, Neb. He realised that the country to the west was Wales, a quite different land from Chirk itself, wi with its miners, with their Shropshire accent, and the middle class that had settled in the houses outside the village. Before long, a meeting of the clergy was held in the vicarage of Llanarmon de Frinkeriog, and he went there with a the vicar. During the meeting, he, as he looked through the window, he saw the long spur of a Berwin rising against the sky, and a thrill went through him. Well, he's had that thrill already in St. Michael's Theological College some years previously. So that's important on a biographical level and a cultural level as well. The other point I'd like to make is this. Um, I don't know whether you noticed, but the fact that some of the images that R.S. would use famously in his poetry in Manavon and later on in Eglusvach are to be seen in embryo here, the sad colours of the hills. Or another quote from this journal entry, the occasional echo of a call to arms. Where have you heard that before? Well, that is uh, incorporated then into poems like Welsh landscape and Welsh history. For example, we were a people taught for war, we will arise and greet each other in a new dawn, or think of Welsh landscape, to live in Wales is to be conscious at dusk of the spilled blood that went to the making of the wild sky. And so that call to arms was reverberating in R.S.'s mind, even, even in 1936 uh, at um, St. Michael's Theological College in Llandaw. So that, from inauspicious beginnings, that I think is a very important personal and cultural document. It's interesting, he's going back and forth between Cardiff and uh, Holyhead, where his family uh, still lived, of course, when he's at Theological College, and he talks there, doesn't he, about seeing the romantic hills to the west as he's uh, making the train, train journey. But, I mean, it's fascinating, this rather romantic image is uh, there that early. Um, so nationalism uh, is one dimension, in embryo, but it is there. The other strand of um, R.S.'s political position, and a lifelong one, was also there. Uh, this is too, too small to, uh, for you to, to read, um, but I, I, I will read it. Um, while he was a curate at Chirk, uh, it was in the late 30s, don't forget, he was, got into trouble with the vicar for speaking out against conscription and the church in Wales support for war preparation. This is the period of Munich, of course, 1938. And amongst his papers, we found this draft of a letter to the press. We've no idea whether it was ever published, but this must be about 1938. The Dean of St. Paul's, in an article in Thursday's Times, has called upon the leaders of Christianity in all countries to unite in condemning war and to appeal for a settlement on the basis of the love of Christ, which is regardless of personal interest. As a young curate, I look and pray for the same thing, for the young clergy of today will have to face the posterity 
of the contemporary greybeards. And only if the Church of Christ in all lands, irrespective of doctrinal differences, has made a superhuman bid for peace, shall we younger clergy be able at a later date uh, to answer the charge of being untrue to the Prince of Peace, a charge much in evidence since 1918. Let us then hear less of the sins of others and of the case of, and of the care of our worldly lives and let us take heed of our own immortal souls in our actions now we stand at the bar of posterity we must not crucify love again crying as we do so his blood be on us and our children pretty strong stuff from, from the young the young curate and you, you know if he's able to write like that uh, it's no wonder he got up the nose of some of the more orthodox uh, uh, priests in the uh, in the area it has to be said of course that uh, uh, pacifism was for him was a lifelong belief and included right to the very end uh, as late as the 1980s his um, uh, being active in CND in North Wales uh, they, they built that uh, regional seat of government you remember in that period in in Carmarthen a uh, big big hole so that when the bombs fell the men in suits would be there and there's RS at the demo you know 70s climbing over the the barbed wire uh, it also of course got him into considerable trouble uh, when he was at Eglis Far because there was a retired military clique uh, there that he didn't get on with General Pugh who was a war hero they made a film about him starring Gregory Peck uh, there's the famous story, there are various versions of it, in 1965 when Churchill was uh, dying, uh, General Pugh says, well, are we going to pray for the old man? Uh, Why? Says R.S. He's dying, it's in the papers. I don't read the papers, he said, and he didn't pray for Churchill. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we have an unparalleled collection here of unpublished um, and uncollected uh, R.S. Thomas poems. <coughs> this is one of them. Um, this is a uh, poem called, or at least going by its first line, uh, He Had a Mirror Fixed. Now, I don't know whether you can see, it's on a piece of uh, ruled uh, paper here, and it's been crumpled obviously been crumpled. Now there are a lot of examples of these crumpled, um, I won't call them drafts because they are finished poems, uh, but there are a lot of this type of thing in our collection. Crumpled, why? Well they were saved from the waste paper basket by Elsie and literally ironed, ironed out in order to keep them. Um, this is a very interesting po uh, poem. I I'll just read, uh, I'll read it to you. He had a mirror fixed at the window so that looking out, he could look in and see the room empty of him. This was the eye's punishment of the mind that thinks it knows what is present. There were occasions when happening to pass by on the outside and thinking there was no one there. He looked in and caught his own face staring at him. He was no Narcissus. There was nothing to attract in a face hungry for better reflections. Is all life like this, a coming and going between the nostalgia of its surfaces and the emptiness that is inside? Now, this is an interesting poem uh, because of that extended trope there of mirrors and mirror imagery, something that runs as a kind of leitmotif, as Katie Gramich and others have pointed out, through R.S. Thomas's work. This is probably the most striking examples uh, of that. There's no time today, obviously, to dissect the poem, but you can recognise here in, the, in that very use of mirrors and reflections and, a refle and the reference to Narcissus, the constant emphasis, and you can see this in R.S.'s total oeuvre, really, Constant emphasis on things, as Tony's mentioned, looking, the anguished uh, consideration of the self, looking in, looking out, looking in on, it, on, on himself, 
that here basically is a poet who is obsessed creatively with issues of things like personal identity, personal anxiety in particular, and also alienation from his own country, from his own countrymen, uh, from himself also uh, to a great degree. By the way, R.S. was not a great reviser. Right? He wasn't a great reviser. We know that from, from the unpublished stuff we've got in the archive. But you can see uh, little rethinks going on here, and you can delve into the actual chronology of the poem through, through, uh, through those means. What I like here is this asterisk here. He wants to substitute the word appetite uh, for nostalgia uh, in, in the middle there. Uh, such revisions as RS did are very illuminating, and there's probably an article to be written on RS's revisions. Tony, any takers? Yeah, well, here's one now. Um, <laughs> It, it, there aren't that many, uh, even in our archive, I think we've got four or five maybe poems where we've got successive drafts. Uh, most of them are ironed. I mean, if it weren't for Elsie, we wouldn't have those. They're all sort of crumpled up. Um, however, uh, one poem, and again, these are in the uh, display case. Um, this is actually quite interesting. Um, there are a couple of fragments relating to this poem, uh, picking up this image of uh, luminary uh, here. Uh, it's a late poem. We can't be sure of the date. It wasn't published in R.S.'s lifetime, and it's another poem uh, to Elsie. I mean, what is striking uh, about the poem in fact, I think it's, it's, it's sense of praise. It's almost, uh, you know, it's not hedged around like so much of ours. Even there's some wonderful poems to um, Elsie, but they're often sort of displaced into the third person, he and she. Uh, there's none of that kind of reserve here. Now, this is the type version. You think, oh, that's the last version. He's finished it, the poem. There are various fragments. Then we get this. So read this, uh, but then he goes back to the poem. My luminary, my morning and evening star, my light at noon when there is no sun and the sky lowers, my balance of joy in a world that has gone off joy's standard, yours the face I recognized when young as though I had known you of old. Come, my eyes said, out into the morning of a world whose dew waits for your footprint. Disdaining a ministrant, I looked God in the eye and took those unfrocked vows that neither the church could void nor the machine cheapen, that with the years have grown to an unseen bond, harder than iron, light as platinum on my ringless finger. Now, most of us would be pretty happy with that poem, I think. Um, the sense of growth, uh, the sense of uh, dedication to her, uh, harder than iron, light as platinum on my ringless finger. But for whatever reason, he went back to the poem. This is, a, a, as we'll see, another handwritten but later draft. And what he does is he enriches the imagery of the religious service in a natural world in the later part of the, the poem. I think it's imagery, I think, owes something to David Ap Gwilym and the sort of pastoral mass that you get there. And he changes the last, uh, the last line. Uh, this poem uh, was only published uh, in a very limited edition. I think it was 15 copies in a private edition that uh, Gwydion Thomas, his son, published in Thailand. So it's not easily accessible. Uh, and so the first publication uh, was in, I'm going to tout the, the publications now, in our uncollected uh, poems that we brought out a couple of years ago. This is one of the, the center's products, as it were, what we did. Well, we discovered uh, 
quite a long time ago, uh, that there were a lot of poems lying around in journals that he'd never collected. Now, some of them, it has to be said, were best uncollected, or they repeated, you know, there were other Yagra Pradesh poems. But there were others, I think, in later years, he was just so fertile. Somebody would write to him for a charity organization. There's a poem in the magazine of the National Migraine Association. And they say, have you got a poem? And he'd say, and he'd forget. And so the, we, we started to notice these. And I think it probably took us about 10 years altogether. I mean, not, you know, work on it all the time. We'd come back and spend a couple of weeks. And, Anyway, we finally got this out under some pressure from Blood Axe in 2013. Uh, and I've forgotten how many poems there are all, all together now, but we didn't publish them all, but they're, you know, they're all in the bibliography. This is, is in there. But let's just look. I mean, you'll need perhaps to look at the two side by side in the, in the case, but the ending, you, you see, is, is somewhat different and richer, I think. My luminary... My morning and evening star, my light at noon where there is no sun and the sky lowers, my balance of joy that has gone off joy standard, that's the same. Yours the face that young I recognize as though I had known you of old. Come, my eyes said, out into the morning of a world whose dew waits for your footprint. And now it changes. Before a green altar with a thrush for priest, I took those gossamer vows that neither the church could stale nor the machine tarnish, that with the years have grown hard as flint, lighter than platinum on our ringless fingers. He makes it plural. Uh, the machine, of course, uh, becomes a sort of the bête noire, almost literally, uh, in the poems uh, that he, he writes in the late 60s, early 70s at Abadaron in the, the volume, the wonderfully entitled volume, hmm, H apostrophe M. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Uh, but the machine is this sort of cartoon uh, figure which represents sort of not merely uh, materialism and industrialism, uh, it represents kind of machine thinking, uh, sort of cliched thinking, insensitivity lack of imagination. Um, but there it is uh, lurking in this, this poem too. And it's here also, because we're going to go back in time just for a moment. This is the only record we have, it's a photograph in, in the archive, of a mural which Elsie did for something called the Ibis Club, which seems to have been a social club uh, for the staff of the Prudential uh, building Society in London, 1939. Um, perhaps her best single known work, perhaps the highlight, the centerpiece of her uh, career really, was the mural she painted on panels for Gaboin Hospital in the 1950s, early 60s, called The Dance of Life. It shows how the natural world and indeed human life was being threatened by human activity in an increasingly mechanical and militaristic world. And this is now, after many years in, in storage, uh, Jason did a TV program about it and saying it ought not to be in storage. And the next thing we knew, it was there at Glyndur University. Um, we, it has to be said that we spent, well, Jason spent quite a long time trying to get it here, but it is so enormous. It's a hundred and 120 feet, it's six big panels. And you can see it in the Art Centre at uh, Glyndura University, and it's well worth seeing. You'll see some of it, I think, is online. But this is 1939. And the point I want to make that, first of all, is some of the themes, in fact, a number of the themes uh, that are there in that much later mural are, are here. Uh, and indeed, that already uh, Elsie and R.S. are really singing from the same hymn sheet. The natural world, the dangers of, of capitalism, the dangers of the machine, militarism. In fact, there are passages in Elsie's journal written in the 80s which could have been written by R.S. Uh, I, I don't think it's, it's kind of, well, it's not mutual influence even, it, it's a kind of a chord. Uh, but, you know, this is before she's met uh, R.S. probably, or just about the time they meet, 1939. Um, again, it's, it's perhaps difficult to see. You've got 
peasant figures. In the front, it, it's a, a, a field. Um, not, it's not harvest as such, but it, it's a rural setting. Um, the peasant figures uh, crop up in um, the, the later mural. Uh, and again, it's dominated by female figures. I'm, I'm working on the autobiography at the moment. And one of the things I want to uh, get to grips with is the gendering in Elsie's work. It's uh, uh, these peasant women. Uh, but this is 1939. What you have here, these serried rows of motor cars. The 1930s is, of course, the great period of expansion of private car ownership. 1935, the Road, the road Traffic Act, the construction of um, the A road. So the car was, was starting to become dominant within British culture. And here in the background, uh, the smokestacks of um, the industrial city. And here, more enigmatically, Parachutes. I'm not quite sure. You know, is, is that rather like the, the jet planes in uh, um, the later mural? Again, a signifier of, you know, 1930s is the great period of uh, development of aircraft. It's the, it's the period when Amy uh, Mollis, Jim Mollison and Amy, what's her name, were making these long uh, record breaking trips on aeroplanes from uh, Britain to. Um, Australia and so forth. It, you know, the, the, the jet pilot is the great heroic figure in Alden, for example. But already here, then, we've got a, a sense of female-centered, rural um, life, but in the background, these other, these other elements are coming, uh, coming in. She's already, I think, writing um, against the machine in 1939. Well, from these massive mural sweeps, um, this is another example of Elsie's work and possibly what she is um, most famous for, uh, for some people at least. This is one of my favourite bird illustrations of which we have many in the, in the centre. Uh, this is a, uh, an illustration, as you can see, of two red stats. And for this type of thing that she became really renowned, certainly in the, uh, in the 1960s and the 1970s, What's interesting, of course, RS also uh, was a great amateur ornithologist, so we're back to the, those kind of artistic, symbiotic, shared concerns between both of them. We were starting to see, basically, that this marriage was, a, was an artistic partnership uh, rather than that uh, quiet um, non-marriage that, that some people think it was. It was anything but. Um, as you can see, these ki this kind of study is beautifully crafted. crafted. It's meticulous in execution and observation, and um, I think transcends the merely illustrative uh, every time for me, these kind of things with, with, with Elsie. As I said, th this is a, a good example of the type of thing that Elsie did in the 60s and 70s, together with studies of um, animals and plants and uh, flowers. Some of you may have um, copies of these at home because many of them were reproduced on Medici cards, um, produced in London, of course, and we have records of um, letters, correspondence of Elsie um, sending the originals and sending things to London from Aberdaron, from, from, from Aberdaron in the uh, 60s and 70s. Now, one thing I'd like to uh, emphasize before leaving this slide is this, that we shouldn't define Elsie according to this kind of study alone. Um, the recent exhibitions that we've been involved in, partly at Bangor Museum and Oriel Plask in the with and Bedrog, have brought together and raised the profile, I'm pleased to say, much of Elsie's work and attest, I think, the fact that she was much more varied ar artist than is commonly thought, um, with portraits, huge landscapes, abstracts, self-portraits, some of which, for example, Gwydion's treasures, we've got uh, at the moment in the, in the archive, and a self-portrait with hand and a J feather. Those kind of paintings, are, for example, are absolutely, for me, astounding. Uh, and all this is, of course, not to mention again, uh, um, Elsie's work as a major British mural artist. Uh, the Goboan mural, as you just heard, at the Ibis Club, of course, uh, goes without saying. 
I'd like to move on to uh, this. Now, um, from afar, it looks a bit of a scroll, but it is anything um, but a scroll, because this is a so-called scroll by one of the twen uh, 20th century's greatest artists in Wales and Britain, David Jones. This is a letter from David Jones, the poet and painter, to R.S. Thomas, dated Christmas 1961. I wouldn't mind having one of those in a month's time. Um, it is, as you can see, a combination, as in Jones's own, own poetry, of Welsh and English, and, as in David Jones's own art, illustrated often with different types of ink. You've got the blue, you've got the black, you've got the green, you've got the red. So it's a work of art in itself. The Welsh, by the way, here, in red and green, reads in Welsh, Dominiadau da o the wrth David Jones, E.R.S. Thomas, Pradith da. Best wishes from David Jones to R.S. Thomas, a fine poet. Now, that's, for me, uh, Christmas 1971, an important cultural moment, we might say. One of the great modernist poets of the 20th century, one of the great artists, David Jones, acknowledging the stature in 1961 of R.S. Thomas, a sort of welcome to the club, Ronald. Um, you will probably know that David Jones is known for his highly elusive, creative stroke, scholarly, uh, deeply referential uh, poetry. So it's interesting to note, what do you talk about to R.S. Thomas in a Christmas card? Well, you talk about his own poetry, of course. And this is a mini essay uh, from David Jones to R.S. Thomas. What he's doing here is he's asking, it's an inquiry really, t about R.S. Thomas's own poem, Genealogy from Tears. When you get home, read the poem. Jones is here in the Christmas card asking about the references to Welsh historical and mythological figures in that poem, Genealogy, by R.S. Thomas. So, here in a Christmas card, what we have is an inter interesting example of two highly elusive poets in a dialogue on a Christmas card uh, about going back to the sources, about establishing a specific Welsh identity in their respective works by means of allusion and echo. And it's a card, I think, that beautifully sums up much uh, about the nature uh, of both poets' cultural uh, visions. So, Nadolig, Llawen, Ronald, at the end there. Tony? The next one, uh, these are just uh, sort of random examples of the correspondence that we've got in the, the archive. This from a, a great English uh, poet, Geoffrey Hill. R.S. had, publicly at least, very little real regard for many of his contemporary English language poets. Ted Hughes, he seems to have, you know, uh, related to in, in various ways at different phases. Uh, but the one poet, the one poet whose work he consistently mentions with admiration is Geoffrey Hill, who until recently, of course, professor of poetry at Oxford. And evidently, the admiration was mutual. We've got two letters from Hill to R.S. and a number of books signed by Hill which he evidently sent to R.S. The first one uh, tells of how Hill had, as a student at Oxford in the 1950s, come across R.S.'s poetry and wrote to him in admiration. Uh, it was Stones of the Field. It was published by the Druid Press uh, in Carmarthen. And Geoffrey Hill in that letter says he'd sent a letter of admiration to the Druid Press, and it clearly never got there. I mean, Druid Press was above a chip shop in Lamas Street in Carmarthen, so God knows what happened uh, to the letter. So it's in a much uh, later letter, sorry, not this one, a much later letter, Hill finally expresses his continued admiration, and then this is the second letter we have, 1996, uh, by this point, uh, Hill is, for a couple of years, a professor at Boston University. I have fallen into the proximity of creative writers, he says uh, darkly. Uh, he says, uh, you'll remember we met once after your reading at the Oakley Festival. It must have been in the late summer of 1980. Uh, you expressed some anxiety that I might fall among structuralists uh, so at Cambridge, and now I've fallen among... Um, he says that there are good, intelligent young people here and in Britain who think as we do and to resist the blandishments and bullyings of the merchants of toxic materials. Their lot is even harder than ours, I think, 
and I grieve for the solitude and desolation that they will have to endure. That's very Geoffrey Hill. But again, that sense of embattled uh, isolation uh, is, is R.S. Um, as well. You remain, writes Hill, after more than 40 years, the only poet to whom I have addressed a fan letter on discovering the stones of the field in Blackwells at Oxford about 1954, it's when Hill was an undergraduate. And I have no reason to think now that anyone else will qualify. And if you know anything about Hill and Hill's criticism, that is, frankly, one hell of a tribute. This is a tribute of another sort. This is one of my favorites, I think. Uh, um, this is a letter from uh, the keeper of the privy purse at Buckingham Palace to R.S. Thomas in 1964, informing him that he is sending R.S., and I quote, by command of the Queen, I am sending you here with Her Majesty's gold medal for poetry, awarded to you for the year 1964. Will you please acknowledge its receipt? The idea of the reverse of the medal, which was des designed by the late Edmund Dulac, is truth emerging from her well and holding in her right hand the divine flame of inspiration. Brute is truth and truth beauty. Well, we also have in the collection a letter to R.S. Thomas from the Poet Laureate at the time, John Macefield, uh, about this very medal. Now, what suggests itself to you? 1964. Well, R.S.'s contradictions culturally have fascinated those who knew him personally um, and those who have written of his work, of, co of course. This, remember, as I say, was 1964, the Egg period, the period of the nationalist, uncompromising, politicised poetry, the so-called middle period, and here's R.S. accepting the largesse of the English throne. Do we have to see a contradiction there? Yes, up to a point. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is I think R.S. Uh, also saw it as a contradiction. He, it was at least something that he was slightly aware of and indeed possibly slightly embarrassed about. Why do I say that? Or at least it was something that he tried to explain away in some sense, though not convincingly. Why? Well, another related item in our collection is a letter sent by Thomas to his wife, Elsie, who happened to be away at the time, informing her thus, and I quote, the Queen does show, have you got that? Yeah. Uh, the Queen does show, does so enjoy, underlined, does so enjoy my poetry that she is going to give me a medal. And then he adds, and this is the, I don't know, some kind of reason or um, explaining away. Perhaps Gwydion, the poet's son, will be able to realise a few shillings on it one day if he is hard up. Well, another letter from R.S. mentions the fact um, that he was disappointed with the medal when it arrived. <laughs> he had apparently been led to believe by who? Macefield, we don't know, that it was, and he says, a thing of beauty. But when it arrived in its box, it obviously hadn't lived up to R.S.'s or Macefield's uh, billing. Again, the contradiction. This is a brilliant slide to, uh, as it happens, to to to, to follow the, the last one. This brings up to the uh, brings us up to the Abadarian period of 1967 onwards, and specifically to RS's tireless campaigning for the pressure group Kvelion uh, Thien in the 1980s. A uh, pressure group of which he was secretary and a founding member, uh, of course. The group um, Kvelion Thien, the Friends of Thien, was were, was a group dedicated to. Um, the promotion of the Welsh language, the ecology, and also the local com economy of the peninsula. And thanks to the kindness of one of the founder members, um, the late Arvon Hughes from Bulch Tokin, uh, we have here in the R.S. Thomas uh, Centre the complete archive of R.S.'s notebooks and correspondence <laughs> as a member of the society. This is one of the highlights. This is a letter sent by R.S. as secretary of Cyfeillion Llyn, to uh, Michael Vickers in 1992. Michael Vickers was the deputy keeper of the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, okay? 
And the letter is regarding two inscribed, very, very important 5th and 6th century standing stones or gravestones from Llyn, which had been taken, um, if memory serves, in the 19th century to the Ashmolean. They are the gravestones of two individuals, Gwyn Hoidl, uh, not the saint as we think now, but a Gwyn Hoidl and a Juvenalis, uh, uh, son of Eternus. R.S., together with his friend and neighbour Gareth Nagel, wanted them back now. He wanted them repatriated to their rightful place. And I'm going to read this letter to you. Many pen priests. The above, Cavillion Llyn, is a society devoted to the general well-being of Llyn, the western peninsula of Gwynedd. We conduct our business and campaigning in Welsh. I write in English for your convenience only. <laughs> I understand that one of our members, who is also editor of our district paper, Mr. Gareth Williams, Rida Bengan Bach, Botunog, visited you some time ago in connection with the above stones and found that they were in the museum basement, covered with dust. Since these stones' original home was clean and since they are doing nobody any good in your cellar, I love that, Ashmolean has a cellar, uh, I would like to put pressure on you to have them uh, return to their rightful home here and clean yours. Uh, faithfully, Aris Thomas, sec secretary. Well, what happened? Well, this basically, uh, these were Aris Thomas's Elgin marbles. Um, there they are. But in stark contrast to the actual Elgin marbles, these stones were indeed repatriated. And you can see them now either side of the door in Oriel Plas Glynewedo. A result, methinks. <laughs> it's worth saying that uh, Michael Vickers came up uh, and uh, met with RS, and they, they apparently got on quite well. Uh, but I, I, I do love that. And I write in English purely for your convenience. How to how to uh, influence uh, uh, people. I want to move on. Uh, RS frequently expressed. Uh, revealed that he knew nothing about art. Uh, well, he lived with an artist for 50 years. Uh, he, uh, Gwydio, in an interview I did with him, talked about how in the years at Eglusvar they'd play a family game where you'd be given three of the little reproductions, postcards, that Elsa used in her teaching. She taught art for extra, uh, extramural department at Aberystwyth. And you'd have to choose one and talk about it as a, and why you, you know what its strengths are and why you'd want that picture on there. He did know a bit about art. Um, in uh, 1985, uh, Poetry Wells Press, as they were then, Seren, published In Growing Thoughts, which is a sequence of poems, a short sequence of poems, um, two pictures by various modern artists, including uh, uh, Dali, uh, Paul Nash, um, Chirico, uh, and the book really has never had much attention paid to it. It's been out of print for uh, a number of years. Well, anyway, uh, eventually um, we acquired the two books that RS found, in which RS found the pictures. They're two books by the critic, art critic Herbert Reed, Surrealism and Art Now. And when we got the two books, interleaved in them were another three dozen poems. Um, and I don't think, we're, we're fairly clear that these are not just the leftovers, as it were. He seemed to have gone on writing them, responding, meditating on um, these um, poems. They date from the 1980s, after R.S. retired from the church, 1978. It seems uh, from other evidence that he did go through a, some sort of period of nervous uh, tension, uh, whether that was related to the retirement or what it was, we don't know. Whatever the reason, there is a re in these poems a recurring sense of dislocation, um, tension, warfare, is a related and recurring theme. And we remember this is the 80s, he's active in, in CND, so there's, there's a connection there. Um, this is one of the um, poems. Um, I've put the, the piece of paper alongside the image. You'll find another, the, one of the books is in the display case. This is one of that marvelous, uh, deeply moving uh, sequence of drawings 
that Henry Moore did in the underground uh, the tube stations where people were sheltering from the air raids. This is 41, shelter drawing. Hands clenched on the dark dream where the sleeper wanders far from the crackling meadows and the sharp flowers with their smell of combustion. Alas, that waking to safety should be waking also to survivors poking among the remains of others who were too brave to dream. A uh, powerful image of what's actually happened and what, the, what they'll find when they get to the, the surface. I, I should add, this is another plug, uh, that we're currently working with Blood Axe on publishing uh, these poems under the title, in fact, of uh, Too Brave to Dream. And Jason, look at another one of these remarkable poems. Well, we're approaching the end. Um, I'll give you another one another example of um, these uh, ecrastic, superb ecrastic uh, poems by R.S. Um, this is uh, the title of this, stri this striking uh, painting, uh, one of three very similar images produced by the Czech painter Toyen in 1934, translates as the voice of the forest. Now, the question is... What do you see there? What do you see there? I'll read the poem first. Owl, you cry, then pause, sensing the lack of talons, beak gone, the hollows where eyes should have been. What name shall we give something that has nothing but existence <coughs> to deserve tenure? Ignore it, says reason, but an echo far down in us responds to what as Stevens would remark, looks as at us without eyes and without a mouth, speaks. Now, it's, it's a great little poem, I think, um, and one that touches on several of R.S.'s major poetic uh, pre, uh, preoccupations across the uh, oeuvre. The process of looking, as we've seen several times tonight, naming, ascribing an identity to an object or even the self, presence, and absence, uh, ex uh, existence is often contradictory, confusing nature. And at the end, um, how many of you noted it? A name check uh, by RS uh, to one of his uh, favorite poems, the American uh, Wallace Stevens. Uh, but basically a, a direct quotation from Wallace Stevens's Yellow Afternoon, where he says, uh, to lie in one's bed in the dark, close to a face without eyes or mouth, that looks at one and speaks, as Stevens would remark, looks at one without eyes and without a mouth, speaks. Well, these ecrastic poems, full of that kind of uh, richness, and uh, we hope that these will be published by Blood Axe, as Tony mentioned, um, sometime next year. Moving on to uh, one of the final uh, images before Tony um, wraps things up. This is a study of RS by Elsie. Um, now compare this to the one we saw earlier. This is the old, or older man. We saw the, um, the other uh, one of the uh, young husband at the beginning of the session. This is a study by Elsie of RS 1977, possibly for a portrait. The original sketch does not survive. What we have in the archive, um, as far as we know, perhaps, perhaps one of you got, has got it. Answers on a postcard. Um, but what, what, is, what this is, is a photograph, um, a photographic record of the sketch. Now, I'm sure you agree, very, very striking. Raptor-like, like R.S.'s own god, uh, and for, forming, as I said, an interesting contrast to some of Elsie's other portraits, of which there are many, of her husband, especially those examples, one of which you've seen already, in that kind of Renaissance red chalk uh, that she did uh, of R.S. as a, a comparatively... Uh, young man. Am I under regard? R.S. asks in one poem. Well, R.S., yes, you are. And memorably so recently, of course, with a host of Welsh artists responding different ways to the man and his work. But R.S., I think, was most compellingly under regard, to use his own term, argument, arguably, by his wife in her revealing, often uncompromising, always memorable portraits of him this being one of the best, I think. She really is. I, I'm, I think this is absolutely haunting. I have this up on my office wall. 
I mean, she's really looking. But if you look you know, at the mouth, the eyes, the ears, the strange ears with no lobes, she, it's a study. Did she ever do the portrait? Well, we don't know. If she did, it's not, it's not survived. After Elsie's death in 1991, R.S. wrote a remarkable sequence of elegies to her, uh, comparable in my view, and I say this carefully, comparable in my view to Hardy's wonderful series of elegies in 1912-13 to his wife. Um, they've been collected, the poems written in his life to her, and particularly these uh, uh, later poems, the elegies in um, Poems to Elsie, um, edited by Damien Walter Davis, and I would recommend that. This has been ironed again. Uh, it's on the back of a bit of note paper. Uh, we don't know when the poem was written. It's not been published. As far as I'm aware, this is the first time it's been shown publicly. It's clearly another poem to Elsie. And we'll end with this. What can I say? I take your hand, leading you out onto the moss-grown floor to dance your age's faltering pervan. Let stiffness be grace. Through the eye's window I see a garden we have not left, but grown old in tending. There is a flower there that has shed its petals, not annually, but day by day, to rebuild itself on its own ruins. Thank you very much. He's going to get to Canaro. Um, so I, I, I will feel that I'll try not to take Jason's name in vain. Um, <laughs> if there are any, any questions from what we've... Uh, oh, we've, we've played with microphones here again. Okay. All right, stick it on. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure anything I say will be worth recording, but there we are. Uh, are there any questions or observations or comments that we have? That Andrew? I, it's a, it is a bit of a mystery, to be honest. Um, somebody did propose marriage to her in London. Now, whether she's running away from that in part, I don't know. That may have been a contributory factor, the fellow student. Um, but, I mean, she has this very successful one-woman exhibition, the Beaux-Arts. Um, but at the same time, she's writing about how little she enjoys exhibiting. People come in and say the daftest things about your pictures. They get all wrong, you know. But she's a very strong-minded woman. I mean, I, my, my, my reference to Jean Brodie was, she was not entirely facetious. I mean, she has opinions, you know. Um, and she, she, I mean, there are some letters much later from uh, Cuffin Williams trying to get her to exhibit at the Royal Cambrian. And he says, I know you have your reluctant, but can I persuade you? And no, you know, she's not going to exhibit. Um, she is involved in a, another mural. She goes off to Italy, um, 34, she's back 35. She's in Oswestry Street by 35. The Beaux-Arts exhibition is 37, so she's, you know, she's not entirely severed. Uh, Gridion always said, this is, Gridion's not born till 45, that you know, she has the exhibition and then leaves. 
but we only recently discovered that in fact she was in Oswald Street by 35. I mean, I, my, my, my rather mundane solution to, to this uh, from the, the journal uh, is that she needed to get a job. You know, she'd had the scholarship from the Royal College, she'd come back and done the uh, Amura Broccoli School, um, she has the exhibition, but she's, you know, she's got to get some money. Um, she thinks about going to, to India, that falls through. I have no evidence that she applied for other jobs. She may well have done, the letters haven't survived. Um, whether she intended to stay in Oxford Street, we don't know. Um, but you're right. I mean, as I said, rather facetiously, she's a, I mean, she's a glamorous figure. Um, heaven knows what they made of her in Hollyhead when he took her home to meet Mother. He had a beard. Uh, she draws him in 1939 with a beard. They go to visit Mrs. Thomas, who was fairly formidable, actually, his mother. Um, I've met people who, who knew her, and you know, she was a dominant figure. And the first thing Mrs. Thomas says, shave your beard off. <laughs> and he does. <laughs> um, but Elsie... She's got no family ties, but she's... No, there's a brother. Uh, he, he's the, the family is still in, in South. They're from, she's from Surrey. Um, I don't think that, I mean, you could argue, well, she meets R.S. and gets stuck. I don't think that's it. I mean, from the letters she's writing uh, to these former students in 1940-41, I mean, she's, she's perfectly happy. Uh, she, she's, she's very rude about the, some of the children she teaches in the Sunday school and in the church. That's not her scene at all. I met a lady in, uh, from Eglusvach, and because I'd read Elsie around the Sunday school, this didn't go at all with the letters I'd written and the general sort of fancy glamour. And somebody told me in Eglusvach, you know, her, she'd go around these, you know, even in the 60s, these very colourful clothes uh, and these big hats with flowers on them. She's still, there's still a touch of the bohemian. She's still the artist. Uh, there are um, the... Um, uh, there's some art connoisseurs who, who retire and live nearby, the barons, um, uh, and she's very friendly with them. So she keeps her artistic connections. She's sending stuff to the Watercolour Society. So I asked this woman, I said, did you really teach Sunday school? Oh, it wasn't a Sunday school. And she said, really? She said, uh, RS would be teaching the older kids um, that for their confirmation. And Elsie would look after the younger kids. And she said, oh, no, she said she told us how to paint mm -hmm. and how to make, you know, potato prints. And she was wonderful, she said. So uh, that's the best I can do. I mean, I, I, I think she wanted out of London. Uh, I, I, and the whole art scene just didn't, for whatever reason, lost its taste. And uh, she carried on. I mean, she, she is sending stuff at a watercolour society. She's selling a lot of art. Uh, through them, um, and I've forgotten the name of the dealers now, and eventually she's involved in the Dietschy, and then of course she, she does the, the, the Gaboin um, uh, mural, it's actually not technically a mural because it's on these canvas, you know, frames, it, it, it is massive. Um, I think it was, I mean, one of the royals, I think it was the Duchess of Kent or somebody came to open it, it needed the royal assent to open it, the Gaboin, and uh, she said, well how many people did you have helping you? <laughs> and, and of course she started at Manavon, this is actually rather a big rectory, and she takes over, she has this canvas all around the drawing room. And of course the NRS decides he needs to go further west to Eglisar, so she has to roll it all up <laughs> and take it, and the two goats that they had, <laughs> to, to Eglisar. It was, it was an interesting relationship, it really was. Uh, Manavon uh, is Newtown is the is the closest uh, Mid Wales. Uh, no, I don't know. He he he's at Manavon, the church there, and then he moves to Eglisvach, uh, you know, near Mahanfleth, and uh, he then goes in sixty seven to Abadaron, and. In each case, in each place, he has responsibility for other churches. So that in Abadaron, for example, he has responsibility for the little church at Tranvileries. But you have it down there, and I always recommend students go down to Abadaron, not when the tourists are there, but spring or the autumn. It's absolutely wonderful. It's another world. 
And the little church of the Clan Violets gets somebody to direct you because it's down a lane. But it is, it's, it's wonderfully simple. It's, it's just a stone building. Uh, and it is the most tranquil church I think I've ever been in. And the, the church in Aberdaran itself is, is wonderful. Um, but yes, he preached, you know, in, 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 in each case. But that's the sort of Manavon, Eglisvar, Aberdaran. I, I mean, he's moving west. I mean, Br uh, Br uh, Byron Rogers' um, book is called The Man Who Went to the West. And, and he, he writes about this himself. So, you know, if he goes any further west, if you know where Aberdaran, the church is probably on the beach. You know, he's going to be in the Irish Sea if he goes further west. But he, he's getting into the heart of Wales. And he's in Aberdaran. You know, he can live his life in Welsh. And interestingly, he stops writing poetry about the Welsh, the issues of, of Wales. And, and that's the period of the great, and I mean great, religious poetry. Um, from, uh, well, the early 70s onwards. I mean, there's religious poetry before that. But, and particularly after 78, when he retires. And the, the priest, the meditator, um, the parson becomes pilgrim, if you, if you like. He, he no longer, I, I think there are real tensions. I mean, he, you know, we know what he's writing in his poetry. It's very challenging, some of it. I mean, I've just read, and it took me, you know, it took me a week, uh, a PhD thesis from a young chap at Cambridge. Um, and, you know, the range of reference is, is really quite phenomenal. Uh, and yet he has to stand up in the pulpit every Sunday and preach to people who are not up to speed with Cambridge postgraduate uh, students. And I think that causes issues. But, of course, once, once he retires, then it's just him. And, and he's God, whoever he or she is. Um, and I think that causes tensions. And he writes to Raymond Garlic in 1990, and Garlic is un undergoing, again, a period of quite acute stress because of his divorce and so forth. And R.S. says something about, uh, oh, he said, I went through this sort of sense of, you know, he doesn't use the word alienation, but that's what he means, um, about 10 years ago, which would be about 1980, you know, roughly. And he, he's on Valium. Now, I, I don't want to suggest a neat, neat cause and effect. He retires as a priest and then he goes through some kind of crisis. But I suppose I am suggesting that. I mean, that he certainly goes through a period of uncertainty. I mean, he's been a priest for, for what, 40 years? And now you stop being a priest. So what are you now? You know, I mean, it's one thing to retire as an academic, but to retire as a priest is some, something different. And he was a man of routine. Uh, and, the, and that routine no longer, you know, he, he would work in the morning, he'd write, he'd read, he'd, he'd go uh, for walks in the afternoon, visit people, and he would also visit the sick and people who couldn't, he would give people communion and so forth. And all that sort of that regularity disappeared, and I, I think it caused stress at that time. It's there in the poetry. Sorry, I shall stop. <laughs> Amazing background, I think, Tony. Thank you. Okay. And, um, I did R.S. Thomas at school, and I'm sure other people have that huge interest. But yeah. I never knew the detailed background to yeah. the artistic partnership with Elsie. Oh, yeah. And certainly that whole thing about getting into a new view and seeing a different yes. way, which so affected his, his poem. Mm -hmm. okay. and, um, and I think also I'd just like to say thank, I really thank goodness she liked Iron. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yes, I should say that we have uh, the drafts of her unpublished um, autobiography in the, in the centre, um, and, and that again is going to get into print at, at some point when we've, when we've got time. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm assuming that there's tea outside.